Jennifer Godard, and her topic tonight is uh, What's New in Radiation Therapy to Treat Localized Disease? And Jennifer presented it here, I think it was in February we're here, you were here. We're so delighted she's back again, and welcome, and we'll move along so you, we can get all from you out of our limited time. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. And I definitely encourage everyone, um, if you can attend any of the nutrition classes and going multiple times, it's great. I think it also adds to us being able to get further funding in the future to keep programs like that going, because we certainly love having that resource available to refer our own patients. So, um, so I'm a little limited in time tonight. Um, I'm hoping to have to leave around the eight o'clock. Um, due to that, I know this is a lot to cover in a short period of time, um, if there's anything on the slide that needs clarification specifically, I ask you to just put up your hand and I'm happy to do that. Um, and I'd prefer to do it right in the moment if you don't understand something on the slide. If you have more of a general question, however, if you can reserve it to the end, I can try to, to stay a few more minutes if there's a lot of pressing questions at the end. Okay? Thanks. So, thanks for having me here. Um, today's talk is going to cover the broad topic of advances in radiotherapy, really over the last 10 years. Um, I'm hoping that by the end you'll be able to actually define what is radiation. It's often a very scary word for many people. Um, well, how has it evolved over these last 10 years? Um, what is its role in dose escalation in localized prostate cancer? What's its role in hypofractionation? and stereotactic body radiation, I'm going to define what these are a little later on, and then finally the role of brachytherapy and how is it extending now into high-risk cancer in combination with external pain radiation. So someone asked me first, well, what is localized disease? Just to clarify for everyone, that's basically when you've had a diagnosis of prostate cancer and you've gone through staging, and not everyone has a CT <coughs> scan or a bone scan, but particularly people with higher intermediate or high-risk disease do have staging scans. If nothing comes back on those scans, so there's nothing in the bones, essentially nothing in the lymph nodes, we would call that localized disease. So what I'm going to talk about today is really all the treatments around localized disease. So what is radiation? Well, typically we refer to radiation as energy that's emitted from a source and transmitted through material or space. This radiation can deposit its energy by removing electrons from atoms. And it's this process called ionization that actually makes the radiation damaging to the cell. It is by removing these electrons that we actually damage the target, which is the DNA that actually lives inside of the cells of the cancer. Um, and that's really how we're achieving cell death, was by stopping the mechanism through which these little cancer cells can divide and proliferate. So much of the physics of radiation oncology is all about where is this energy being deposited and maximizing its deposition in the disease tissue and, of course, minimizing its deposition in healthy tissue. Um, and so much of the physics around radiation is sort of trying to get that good therapeutic ratio where we really are able to fight the disease while still sparing the organs that are, of course, surrounding that area. So how do we look at radiation? And so this is kind of complex, but we actually study this quite a bit when we're going through our training, and these are called dose depth curves. So what you have is the depth on the x-axis, and so you can imagine if you're going with a patient, this could be depth within the skin and then deeper beyond, of course, then there's the organs or anything like that. And then the dose is actually what is actually being deposited. And what's interesting about radiation is each, depending on the energy of the radiation you use, a different dose can be achieved at a different depth in the patient, and you can maximize that so that you can actually shape where you're going to allow the maximum amount of energy to be deposited. And the reason I bring up this depth dose curve is later we're going to talk about protons, and you may hear more about protons when you go on the internet or particularly here in the United States, but it's often argued because there are different properties between what we call photons, and that's what's the majority of the external beam radiation what you're being treated with versus protons. So these curves here, these are the energies. 18 MMB is a higher energy than 6 MB and cobalt. And you can see that you know, the higher the energy, it's going to deposit a dose at a, at a larger depth. Those things are interesting from a radiation oncologist's point of view. It's, we're choosing these things for you when you go through <coughs> treatment. But it's just to say that although we may choose an energy that's going to deposit at a particular dose at a depth, it continues on. So it continues to deposit energy beyond the depth 
at which we want it to go. So wouldn't it be great if you could just deposit it at three centimeters and then nothing goes beyond that? Um, and that's one of the properties of protons that I'm going to talk about a little later. So I just want to introduce this concept that, yes, radiation is energy emitted, but it's energy emitted that we can measure. And it can be measured in a very specific way. And so it's all to do with the properties of the beam that's actually treating that patient. So how do we actually make radiation? Um, there's two primary ways that we make radiation. One is with external <coughs> beam radiotherapy. Um, those are high energy x-rays, or what I was calling photons. That's what we were just looking at, with depth of pairs of photons. Those are usually made from the external source, and that's usually a linear accelerator, which is that big machine, if you've ever been in radiation, it's called a LINAC. Um, but there's also another kind of machine that delivers the same photons, also called a cyber knife. And I'm bringing these topics up because you might read around them, and you start to wonder, well, what's the difference in why does somebody get to you with a cyber knife and I only got a Linux? So I'm going to talk a bit more about that. Um, the other one is protons. So protons are primarily in the United States. There are proton facilities in Canada, but I would say they're not really made to the capacity to treat a patient <coughs> such as a prostate cancer patient. For example, in Vancouver, they, they treat a lot of uh, eye melanomas, um, but they don't quite have the jigs and reels that you need to treat a prostate patient, and it requires huge amounts of investment. Um, in money. Um, so we don't have that. And why do we not have it? I'm going to talk about that in a few minutes. But basically, it's an, also an accelerator, but in this case, instead of making photons, hydrogen atoms are separated into electrons, and positively charged protons are then ejected. And the proton is then fired at the patient to treat the patient. What about brachytherapy? Well, that's a different way. It's an actual radioactive source. Um, it's an isotope that is decaying, and it is, it decays, it gives off energy. And some of that energy is photons, some is gamma rays, some are alpha particles, but essentially it's that isotope that's delivering the radiation to the patient. And there are different sources that are used for prostate cancer, and I'm going to expand on that in a few minutes. So this is a linear accelerator, just to explain what you're actually getting treatment with. Um, this is the primary machine that we use for external beam radiation. Once this is plugged into the wall, electrons are passed through the gantry or the head of the machine. It comes out through what we call the collimator. And then this is where the therapeutic beam sort of comes out. And it rotates all the way around the patient. And on a LINAC, particularly, it rotates around one single center called the isocenter. And modern machines now will have another little thing that's kind of attached to it. And this is actually an x-ray with a detector. And that can also rotate around the patient. That's a huge advent, because now you can image a patient while you're treating a patient. So obviously, this head is giving the radiation beam. And these detectors are actually can create an image so you can get a CT scan in real time when you're actually seeing a patient on the treatment machine. And I'll expand upon that. What is a cyber knife? OK, so this is very similar to a LINAC. We do not have this here in British Columbia. Um, but it's offered in the States and many other centers. Um, this plugs into the wall, also has electrons that run through it, and also puts out photons. So the actual beam coming out of this machine is not that different. What's different though is you can see it's on this little robotic arm. So instead of rotating around the patient, it's incredible. It kind of moves and it's almost like it's alive and it moves into all these different directions. And instead of having one center through which you know, all these beams are being rotated, you can see they're all coming from different angles. And there's multiple beams. Just You can see hundreds of them coming around. Um, what's unique about this treatment is that there are x-ray detectors in the room, and it follows the movement of the organ in real time. Now, that's important when it's used using CyberKnife because this is a very complex treatment, and whereby more modern Linux these days, I would say, can treat a prostate cancer patient if you're treating the prostate alone within about two to three minutes. These treatments can sometimes take up to a half hour or beyond. And during that time, the prostate is certainly going to move up, so you definitely need a better tracking to, to, to be able to, to achieve good target localization. Um, and so what's unique with CyberKnife is you can achieve these great doses, but you can also follow the movement of the organ you're treating. Um, and that's sort of why CyberKnife has become so popular. But as treatments have gotten shorter and shorter with some of the LINAC-based treatments, the need for the tracking during treatment has lessened. Good question for you. Yeah, good question. Go ahead. Radical cost effect can you, can you use CyberKnife so the interesting question was, can you use CyberKnife after a radical prostatectomy? Um, so I have not seen it done, um, but I'm sure you could. There's no reason why you couldn't. Um, 
giving radiation after a prostatectomy, it's all about you target a volume. So you can treat that volume with either machine. But in terms of the accuracy you get with CyberKnife, the biggest advantage is when you start to really escalate the dose and you have a moving target that's easy to see. So just to mention is that most CyberKnife treatments are based around having a prostate already there that you put fiducials into. And fiducials are little gold seeds you actually place inside the prostate so you can see the movement. And so if you don't have fiducials in there to, to see, I don't know if the CyberKnife is going to get you any better than a regular lymphatic treatment. I think the main advantage is when you're treating prostate in situ rather than post-surgery. Um, now, proton therapy, which I've mentioned, that's different. It's not photons, it's protons. So it's hydrogen atoms in a big linear accelerator being sped up, being separated into electrons and protons being spat out, and then they go into multiple treatment rooms. I mean, this is huge, the, these treatment rooms, these, uh, these accelerators. And then this is what a treatment room looks like. So when the patient's actually inside, it's not so intimidating. And it looks very similar as you would for any kind of uh, you know, linear accelerator. It looks very similar with a treatment head and a treatment bed. Um, what's different about protons is they're achieving physically, like the physics of the proton is what we were just talking about. So this is the photon. It enters the body. So this is, again, the depth in the body. This is the amount of radiation. So it enters the body. It deposits a dose at a certain depth, which is its maximum. And hopefully that's where the tumor is. And then it gradually comes off over time. So there's still exit dose. What a, what a proton does is it deposits its energy at a particular depth, and it's called the Bragg peak. Um, and then beyond that, there's actually not much exit dose. So the properties you would think would be ideal, that maybe you would see less side effects with a beam that goes at a certain depth and then stops. Um, and certainly there's a lot of hope around that for protons, but I'm going to expand about what's, what's the results in uh, prostate in a few minutes. So finally, brachytherapy. Brachytherapy means short distance. And again, it's usually an unstable isotope, decaying photons, electrons, gamma rays. And it all varies in half-life and the energy of the emitted particle. And what's really specific about brachytherapy is you usually implant these seeds or whatever we're implanting the source inside the tumor. And so you can achieve an extremely high dose inside the tumor. But what's super characteristic about this is that it actually decays um, as, it, as you move further away from it, the actual dose delivered to the surrounding tissue becomes very low, very quickly, within millimeters. And so that's what really contributes to the unique properties of brachytherapy. It can, it sort of kind of cuts off the dose very close to the organs of risk. And therefore, again, you're trying to diminish the side effects. So you're able to achieve a very high dose by putting this implanted um, seed directly into the prostate but then minimizing the dose just because of the properties of the isotope itself. So how has external beam radiation changed over the last, say, 30, well, more than 30 years? Well, we initially used to treat prostate cancer based on bony landmarks. So x-rays were taken, and based on those x-rays, beams were then targeted into the prostate. Then along came CT scans. Then we could CT scan a patient, and we could see the prostate, we could see the bladder, we could see the rectum. But we still had machines that would essentially deliver squares of radiation coming from each angle. And you can see there's sort of like a square of radiotherapy treating the prostate in the center. Then we moved into modern in image or intensity modulated radiotherapy called IMRT. We also treat with VMAP, volumetric arc therapy. So with all these fancy IMRT VMAP. But what it means is instead of treating with a big square box, so going from different front sides and back of the patient, we're able to actually modulate the intensity of the beam across that square. And so instead of getting just a big square of high dose in the middle, you can see you can shape the dose so that you can spare some of the rectum that's sort of sitting in the back here, or you may not want to treat too many and too much of the hips, um, or you may not want to treat too much of the bladder. And so you can shape that dose into these really interesting shapes, whereas before you were really left with big squares. Now we can do these really interesting circular shapes and we can really modulate where that high dose is going to be deposited. And so that's really what's given us this VMAT and IMRT. Well, what's the difference between these two words? IMRT was really the first technique and that was coming from various angles around the patient. The, the, the treatment machine still moved all around the patient, but it stopped in particular positions and turned on the radiation beam. 
What VMAT does is it moves 360 degrees around the patient, and the entire time that it's rotating around the patient, it's delivering radiotherapy. And so you have all these degrees of freedom of where you can modulate that beam, and you can shape that dose. What that allows for is really good beam shaping, so you kind of try to spare the organs as much as you can. It allows you to bring up the dose, but it also allows you to shorten the treatment time, and that's huge, because the shorter the treatment time, it's convenient for the patient, but it also means the prostate's gonna move less, there's more, less variability, and that allows you to better target what you're actually trying to treat. So VMAT has allowed us to get to about one and a half to two minutes of treatment, whereas IMRT, we're still up around six minutes or so. So that is now allowing for image-guided radiation. Um, so again, we're back to our LINAC, and we've got this CT scanner, or it's called a cone beam CT, on the treatment machine. What it enables us to do is anyone who's gone through radiation is you initially get a CT scan. And that CT scan, we, we delineate the prostate, the bladder, the rectum, and the hips. And then we can know where do we want to deliver this dose, and we want to make sure we spare, of course, the bladder and the rectum. Then when the person comes for treatment, we take one of these CT scans and we then look, where is the prostate? And in fact, it has moved. So here you can see the rectum suddenly full of gas. The prostate's moved more anteriorly, so it towards the front, and the bladder is in a different space. And had we just treated exactly as we had planned, we would have missed the prostate, we would have treated more of the rectum. There's different ways of doing image guidance. It doesn't have to be a cone beam. Another way of doing it, as I spoke about before, is putting little gold seeds inside the prostate. And those little gold seeds we can easily follow, and that's another way of using image guidance. Um, and in some ways, it's actually sometimes even more precise than doing a cone beam, uh, cone beam scan. That's getting into details, but it's just to say there are multiple ways to achieve image guidance, and the new standard of care is to incorporate image guidance to all prostate cancer treatments. What is that allowing us to now do is to bring up the dose of radiation. And that is the general trend. So these are five randomized clinical trials. Um, typically they used a lower dose of radiation, so a lower dose would be between 64 and 70 gray, and then versus something up around 80 gray, so 78 or 80 gray. And gray is just the dose that we're delivering. When you look at these trials, just so you know what we're actually looking at, when you're trying to deliver 70 gray, that typically takes about seven, almost seven weeks to deliver. If you start delivering 80 gray, you're giving up around eight and a half, almost nine weeks of treatment. And the reason for that is we typically give two gray for each day of treatment. So you take any one of those doses, you divide it by two, and you get how many days you've treated. And with radiation, we treat Monday to Friday, so five treatments a week. So these are very long treatments, um, you know, long for the patient, um, long for the treatment unit. I mean, patients are there for a very long time. Um, and of course, the higher the dose, the longer the patient has to go through. But what they saw is that people had basically, at this stage, higher biochemical disease-free survival. What does that mean? A higher proportion of patients were still alive with an undetectable PSA. Okay, but what didn't make a difference was overall survival. So the patients, whether you got the lower dose or the high dose, you were still alive at the same rate, but there were more patients that had an undetectable PSA. So it, was, it seems to be working. It seems to be more effective. Um, now, what they did find, though, is there were more grade two gastrointestinal or bowel toxicities. So what does that mean? More patients had diarrhea, sometimes up to four to five times a day, and more patients had bleeding from the bowel. Um, now, what did they find? So basically, they didn't all use this new guidance we were just talking about, IMRT or IGRT. So image guidance was not standard in these trials, um, and IMRT was not always standard in these trials. And those, as we talked about, <coughs> were able to achieve better sparing of the organs and better following of the target. And although there have no, been no, no trials, they've done case-to-case -case comparisons of men getting IGRT and men getting the more traditional, what's called 3D conformal. And when you get into the higher doses, if you compare cases to cases, there seems to be less toxicity. 
when you're using image guidance. So it doesn't mean if I'm consenting a patient to some high dose radiation, I still say, you know what, we have a, a, a chance of diarrhea, we have a chance of bleeding, but I hope by incorporating fiducials, for example, or cone beam CT daily, that perhaps we're going to be able to bring down that percentage of toxicity as much as we possibly can. But I can't say there's a big randomized clinical trial to show that. What I do know is by bringing up the dose, there's a better chance of curing that cancer. And so nowadays, in a very fit man with prostate cancer, we are pushing the dose. Um, well, if we're pushing the dose and we want to spare organs, what about protons? We talked about this concept of sort of the dose being deposited with protons and then less exit dose, so perhaps less toxicity. And particularly if you go to the internet, you read anything in the United States, there is a huge amount of literature out there saying, you know, come get your protons, you're going to have less toxicity. Well, is there actually evidence for that? Well, there's no current randomized clinical trials comparing IMRT to protons. So we basically don't have the answer. What we do know, though, is when you compare case series, so that's, again, comparing alike patients who've been treated with protons to like patients treated with IMRT, and pretty significant numbers of patients. You can see over 1,000 patients in one arm, up to 200 in another, you know, up around 100 for these two trials here. They did not show any difference in bowel or bladder toxicity, whether people were treated with photons, with very, you know, advanced photons with IMRT and IGRT, versus protons. So in matched case series, they've shown no difference in prostate cancer outcomes. There have been large studies, Medicare-based matched data, so again, matching thousands of patients that have been treated with protons and thousands of patients that have been treated with photons. There was no difference found, again, in sexual or urinary function. But there is a randomized clinical trial that is open and that hopefully may come out in the next few years. And they're comparing, effectively, IMRT to proton therapy, and their primary endpoint is the toxicity of the bowel at two years. So we may have an answer in five more years. I could come up here and say there is truly evidence to say whether one is better than the other. So as we evolve, what we do know from here, just to summarize, is that IMRT and image guidance definitely helps us and hopefully diminishes our toxicities. It is allowing us to increase the dose of radiation. And in those trials, we typically looked at a standard fractionation called two gray per fraction or two, day, two gray per day. The new revolution of looking at prostate cancer is can we shorten that treatment time? Gosh, it would be nice not to have to treat someone for like eight weeks, almost nine weeks of treatment of daily treatments. And giving a bigger dose per fraction in prostate cancer, there's a theory that prostate cancer may divide more slowly than some other cancers. And in fact, by giving a higher dose per day, may actually be more effective at killing those cancer cells. So not only is it more cost effective for the healthcare system, time effective for the patient, perhaps it even may be better for the cancer itself. And this process is called hypofractionation. So what has been done in hypofractionation? Well, there's now been multiple clinical trials testing this theory. The most recent actually just was published this year, um, called the CHIP trial. Um, but if you look across it, they're comparing a 38 to 40 treatment regimen versus a 19 to 26 treatment regimen. So you're going from an eight and a half week down to four week treatment. And this is where we really want to go um, because of all the reasons I've sort of gone over. And what they found isn't that it's better, but it seems to be equivalent. And that in itself is proving a good thing because if it's equivalent and it's shorter and easier for the patient, that would be a win. What it's also showing is so far, it has equivalent toxicity. Now, it didn't show that in every single trial, but the majority trials, with the exception of one, that showed somewhat higher GI toxicity, which is bowel toxicities, so slightly higher diarrhea in some patients getting the, the shorter fractionation. Um, but the majority found that there was no increase in toxicity. So from that, this is a cancer care consortium for North America. It basically said that moderately hypofractionated IGRT, so going over four to six weeks, have been tested with similar efficacy and similar toxicity, and they may be considered as an alternative. So what we're shifting in our practice is we're moving from 39 treatments, we then moved to 28 treatments, and we're now writing up trying to move to 20 treatments. 
So it would be interesting if you talk to friends, you might say, well, what the heck? I had eight weeks of treatments. You're getting four weeks of treatments. You know, what, what's the reasoning behind this? It's because there's more evidence, and that evidence is actually quite recent. So we're trying to make changes as the evidence comes out. Um, and so we're writing that up now in the hopes that we can deliver this. What we have to use caution with, though, is it's not good for every single patient. And in fact, in some subgroup analysis, those that had quite bad bladder function, so people, for example, who pee a lot during the day, have a lot of frequency, a very weak stream, get up a lot at night, it may not be the ideal treatment regimen for those people because they may have more toxicity of the bladder because of those shorter fractionations. So we're certainly not going to rule it out to everyone. Um, it's also important why we always ask these annoying questionnaires to everybody who comes to see us about how much you pee at night and when you pee, at, and, you know, how frequent you pee. And it is really important when we're trying to make a decision of what's the best regimen to offer you. So finally is stereotactic radiotherapy. And this is the ultimate in hypofractionation. So that's going, you know, taking eight weeks, we're going down to four weeks. Now we're going down to five treatments. Five treatments only. So what do we call this? There's lots of fancy four-letter words. It's SBRT, which means stereotactic body radiation, or SABER, which is um, stereotactic ablative radiotherapy. Um, it's an emerging technology. It delivers high precision radiation. So again, using a lot of the image guidance that we've talked about, but it's delivering more than five gray per fraction. And remember, the typical fractionation is two gray per fraction. And it goes up to seven to even 10 gray per fraction. Um, and it's typically delivered in four or five fractions. So that's four or five treatments and you're done. Um, now the majority of these trials have been single arms. So they're not randomized trials like I've been showing you so far. Um, but for patients with low and intermediate risk prostate cancer, it appears to achieve high disease control and low toxicity rates. This is the largest study. Um, this was just published in 2013, and this, this had eight institutions with over 1,000 patients, so probably the biggest study in this particular area. Um, most patients received 35 gray in five fractions, um, and the follow-up was for over three years. And what they found down here, so this is a Kaplan-Meier curve, just to explain what the heck this is. So this is time, so this is time zero, of course, at diagnosis and then treatment and then going out over months. And this is the percent of people that are still alive and are diseased without signs of disease. <coughs> so what you want, the best curve, is if you have it straight across, and 100% are with you all the time free of disease. But what happens is events happen, and that's what these little, little marks are. And then an event happens, the curve drops, because it's no longer 100% that are with you with no disease, it's 90% that are with you with no disease. And so basically what you take from this is that the lower this curve goes, that's not what you want to see. It's basically people are falling off. They're not dying, but they're having a recurrence of their prostate cancer. And what they found was in low risk disease, 95% of people at five years were free of disease. In intermediate risk prostate cancer, 84% of people were free of disease at five years. And in high risk patients, 81% of people were free of disease at five years with a treatment that was only five fractions of radiation. So it's kind of you know, revolutionary for us to think that you can deliver that much dose safely and still achieve good disease control. And I would say all those numbers are good disease control for each level of risk of the prostate cancer. Okay. Due to the uh, fewer fractions, are you able to uh, do a, a, an additional radiation? Right, so the question was, well, when you do fewer fractions, can you still deliver more radiation afterwards? And I would say no. But in the majority of even the folks that were giving four weeks of treatment or eight weeks of treatment, we wouldn't want to deliver more radiation either. We're always kind of at the brink of the tolerance of that tissue. Um, in terms of the quality of life of these patients, now it's early days. Because I really feel with any new treatment, particularly radiation, five years is just not enough. You still need 10 years to live at quality of life for patients. Um, but generally, in the first three months, bladder and bowel domains were actually very good and returned to baseline or better within six months and remained there for five years. So at least preliminary data, despite giving these high doses, were achieving good quality of life. 
So what does that mean? Well, based on currently available data, this is the American Society for Radiation Oncology says that it's an appropriate alternative for select patients with low to intermediate risk disease. We are not currently doing SBRT as standard of care. We still feel it's a bit early, but we do have a trial that is open comparing people getting 28 treatments, so just over four weeks, um, about five weeks really, versus five treatments. So this is an open study. Dr. Alexander is the main person uh, heading it, but any of us can enter patients into, into this. If you're ever interested, it's for intermediate and high-risk patients, but we do look at patients who have a low nodal risk, so that is something your oncologist would talk to you about. Everybody does get hormone therapy, and then they're randomly assigned to getting standard or the SBRT. So it's a random allocation. You can't just be given it yet. So finally, I'm just going to end with a, with a chat about brachytherapy and what's <coughs> So first, what is it? We talked a little bit about, well, that's one of the ways radiation can be delivered. It's an isotope that is decaying and giving off the energy, and that's kind of what's targeting the DNA. Well, how is it actually delivered? Two ways. One is called low-dose rate brachytherapy. That is the most common, and we probably have one of the largest programs in the world in British Columbia. Um, definitely one of the largest in North America of low-dose rate brachytherapy. Um, we use the isotope of iodine-125, and that's important because its half-life is 60 days. So it actually lasts in the body for two years. Two years, it's decaying. But 90% of that dose is given in the first year, and a very small amount is given in the second year. And in fact, the majority is given in the first three months. And that's exactly how the side effects follow that same profile. How is it delivered? It's done in the operating room. People are generally under anesthetic, although it can be done with spinal anesthetic and sometimes even local. Um, an ultrasound is placed in the rectum. Let's see if I can find my pointer. Um, so that's into the rectum. A template is kind of up against the skin. And then we place needles down into the perineum, which is the skin just as you raise up the testicles. And using guidance, using the ultrasound, we can actually see each placement of these needles. And we insert the needle, and as we take out the needle, we leave seeds in place. And that's what kind of leaves this pattern of strands of seeds left behind. And as those seeds are made out of titanium, and that's the casing, and inside is the iodine-125, and it's decaying over time. Um, what we do for every patient who has this procedure, it takes about an hour in the OR. The catheter is usually placed during the OR procedure. The person wakes up with the catheter, is then transferred over to the cancer agency where a CT scan is done immediately so we can see the actual positioning of the seeds. And then that person's catheter is removed, and then they go home. What about high dose rate brachytherapy? Well, currently it's not available everywhere. It's only available in Kelowna, and it's only available on clinical trials. So again, you can't just choose to get it. Why is that? Well, really it's because that's how we started the program with low dose rate. And high dose rate is not used as frequently as a therapy by itself called monotherapy. It's often used as a combination therapy with external beam. And it's definitely being studied more and more, both as a monotherapy and as combination treatment. But currently, because our program was based around low dose rate bracket therapy, that's what we have available. Uh, there are no trials head-to-head -to, -head to compare one to the other, so we can't say one is better than the other, but that's definitely what we're trying to test in colon, so I think that'll be interesting. How is it delivered? Exactly the same way as low-dose rate. It has needles that goes in, go in with ultrasound guidance in the rectum, um, and what's different is these needles are placed during the OR. The OR can take up to a couple of hours, whereas the other one takes only one hour. The reason is that then this machine which houses the actual source of iridium, so it's not iodine, it's iridium, it has a much, much higher dose rate. The dose rate is a thousand times higher than the iodine-125, so it's delivering dose at a massive rate. What it allows you to do is, once you have all these needles secured in place, and this little catheter is placed here, the one source comes out and kind of trickles through at different dwell positions, so that different positions within each one of these catheters, and it delivers the treatment in real time over about eight to 10 minutes. The catheters are removed, the source is no longer in the patient, and there's no radioactivity afterwards. Different than low dose rate where you leave the seeds in and they decay over time. 
So everyone worried, of course, that you're giving a huge dose in a short period of time, is it going to be safe? What I can say is, although there's no head-to-head -head comparison, the toxicities seem to be similar. And so that's why they're wanting to compare them and say, is there truly one that's better than the other? So how are you eligible? Um, it varies across, go ahead, here's a question. When you say toxicity is similar, is, is that over a five year or shorter? So period? very hard to say. Um, so the question is, are there to so when I say toxicities are similar, what does that really mean? Um, so I would say all of my experience is in low dose rate brachytherapy. All my experience is reading around high dose rate brachytherapy. If you look at the time frames of the introduction of both techniques, they're very similar. So they've been around for over 10 years. Our own database has over 15 years of follow-up. So I think we can really say, yes, they, they have uh, similar. In terms of what is similar between them, um, I would say, I mean, it's very hard, it's, it's complex. Um, but in theory, um, we, the big ones we look at are the grade three toxicities. So those are the hard ones on people. It's not because we don't worry about grade one and two, but those are ones where you just have a lot of urgency, frequency to go to the bathroom, bothersome, but still manageable. But grade three urinary toxicity needs a stricture. What a stricture means is that somebody needs to go in and dilate the urethra, and eventually some people actually need to self-catheterize to keep that stricture open. So those are the kinds of toxicities we worry the most about. Um, and in terms of brachytherapy on its own, with low dose rate, we usually see that number somewhere around 5%, 5, 6%. HDR is similar. Now, it's not like that across all studies, and we have one of the biggest programs. We certainly were trying to follow stricture rates, and I'm gonna talk more about combination treatments, but that's when the stricture rates start to go up. And that's where I think it's gonna be interesting to see if are we gonna see the similar numbers in high dose rate combination treatments, and I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, in terms of brachytherapy eligibility, um, people getting monotherapy, so that means brachytherapy alone, tend to have low or low tier intermediate risk disease. And for anyone who's not familiar with those terms, we categorize prostate cancer based on what we feel on the exam, and that's kind of these T2, T2C, up to T3A, the PSA, and then the Gleason score, which is the grade of the prostate cancer. <coughs> Depending on that, we categorize them into these different tiers. Why do we do that? Is because as you move to the right, to the higher risk, there's a higher risk of spread to the nodes, and there's a higher risk of spread to the bloodstream. And the higher the risk, the more we tend to offer combination treatments. Um, and so combination treatments is combining external beam radiation, often with hormone therapy, and typically nowadays, it's even considering combining hormone therapy, external beam radiation, and brachytherapy. And it's what we call triple therapy. And I would say we weren't using it up until about five years ago. And it was a seminal trial that came from British Columbia that has really put it on the map as a very good treatment for high-risk disease. And that's what I'm going to talk about now. Um, if you have questions about monotherapy, I can absolutely answer them at the end. But why high tier, intermediate, and high risk disease? Well, what do we do generally in those cases of prostate cancer? Well, we've already covered dose escalation. So higher doses do tend to improve biochemical progression-free survival. So again, more men are cured. So more men have a lower PSA and are alive as you escalate the dose. We also have shown that in the long term, hormone therapy improves not only that biochemical progression free survival, but also local, distant, and even overall survival. So men with high risk disease in particular, we always combine with hormone therapy. How much we use the hormones has been changing over the years, but there's no doubt there is a survival advantage in high risk disease with typical radiation doses. And the reason I say that is because we kind of covered already is that we've been escalating the dose over the last 10 years. So the old trials that showed survival advantages with long-term hormone therapy, we're talking three years of hormones, were in an era when we used lower doses of radiation. There are newer trials now trying to question, do we need that same amount of hormones when we're escalating the dose of radiation? And we don't know the actual answer to that yet. And it was a question. Do you understand the mechanism of ADT? How it works. Yeah. There are many theories, and I won't get into them today, honestly. Yes, no. I think 
No, not entirely, but we do know that it seems hormone therapy is most effective when you use it prior to radiotherapy and during radiotherapy. How much you need to use after radiation, I think, is still a bit questioned. We know it's sensitizing, so for example, the same dose of radiation may kill more cells if a person or if an animal has lower testosterone in their body. Why that is, we don't know all the answers to that. Um, finally, the last one is pelvic radiation. I only bring that up because different men have different treatments, but in high-risk disease, we sometimes consider using a larger pelvic field and treating all of the lymph nodes. That adds to toxicity, but the hope is that maybe we're treating microscopic disease in that particular area. There's only been one trial that actually compared people getting pelvic and not getting pelvic, and it was a total mismatch. We, we didn't really get anything conclusive from it. It seems that it may improve the biochemical progression-free survival when you give it neoadjuvant or hormones along with it, but I would say the easiest answer to tell you is we don't know if pelvic radiation is doing its job. So we're, we're always sort of trying to look at the patient, weigh the options, and decide for that particular individual whether we should treat the pelvis, because we don't have concrete evidence to say we have to, um, but it's certainly something we always think about in the back of our minds with high-risk disease. So those are the three areas we were working on for high-risk disease. Dose escalation, the role of hormones, and whether or not to give pelvic radiation. Why is that important? Is it was the center team was the major trial that was comparing all men getting pelvic radiation, all men getting one year of hormone therapy, and then randomizing people to getting the remainder of the radiation with external, so up to 39 treatments, that's that typical dose we were talking about, so almost nine weeks of treatment, or getting the remainder of their treatment with a brachytherapy boost. So in other words, everyone got one year of hormones, everyone had their pelvic lymph nodes treated with external beam radiation, and half of the men got brachy, and half of the men finished their treatment with external beam. So what happened to these men? Well, the primary, I'll just kind of skip to the fancy diagram, Again, what we want to see with one of these Kaplan-Meier curves is that this just keeps going straight across, because that would mean 100% of the men are cured. As it drops, less and less men are cured, and these are the events, or all those little ticks. The red are the people that got brachytherapy. The black are the people that got external beam and hormone therapy. And it keeps dropping. So there's no doubt when you give a higher dose of radiation, you achieve a higher cure rate. And that's what we found. And so this has changed the landscape across the world. This was the first trial, and it came from British Columbia, that showed the addition of brachytherapy, as compared to just external being in combination with hormones, had an advantage. But that advantage, again, just to emphasize, was not survival. It was the percentage of men who had an undetectable PSA and were alive. So no detectable disease. And this just shows when you look at all the different variables, it still was significant. That's just important in a statistical way. When you look at survival, though, the survival was the same. At seven years, 95% of men were still alive with high-risk disease. So even a man walking into the office and, you know, they might say, geez, you know, you didn't have this brachytherapy available to me. I wish I had gotten it. I can say, well, at seven years, you still had a good chance of being alive. The problem is you might have had a recurrence of your prostate cancer. And as you might know in the room, obviously if you have a recurrence, there are other treatments, and there are all the life issues with that, and it keeps going from there. But what was it the expense? Is that when you compared men who got brachy compared to people who got just external beam, the stricture rate, so this grade three geotoxicity that I was just talking about, was 19% in people who got brachy and 5% in people who got just the external beam. So we paid a price, or patients really paid the price for this higher dose. And what we're still working to understand is why do the strictures happen? Is it a dose issue and we just can't control it? Is there something you know, within the quality of the implants that we can change? So we're, we're looking at modifying, and we already have modified techniques, but when we're consenting patients to this kind of treatment, it is one of the factors we need to talk about, which is, yes, you'll have a higher cure rate, but you may have a higher rate of a stricture as a result. So in the context of 12 months of hormones and whole pelvic radiation, because everybody did have their lymph nodes treated, 
the BRCA boost resulted in a 50% reduction in the biochemical relapse compared to dose escalated radiation. And at five years, there doesn't appear to be a difference in overall survival or prostate cancer specific survival. But there was an increase in these grade three late GU or bladder toxicities, mostly as urethral strictures. So what did we cover in longer than I expected? Um, so there have been technological improvements in radiation delivery. Um, it's allowed us to improve target coverage, so our prostate coverage, and decrease doses to surrounding organs. It has improved, this dose escalation has improved biochemical progression-free survival, but not overall survival. This idea of shortening the treatment time and hypofractionation shows similar efficacy and toxicity to the conventionally fractionated radiation. SBRT, or stereotactic body radiation, is a really interesting new alternative, and I would say it's still under study, even here in Victoria. And in high-tier intermediate and high-risk prostate cancer, this combination of external beam and bracket therapy does seem to be superior to external beam by itself with hormones. But again, it comes with higher toxicity. And that's something that's important for us to talk about with patients as we move forward. So thanks, and uh, we'll leave for questions. Go ahead. Yeah, you mentioned uh, a lot of damaging uh, two other organs when you have the VRT uh, and the rectal area is damaged or the different places. How much damages uh, have you heard of that are serious about rectal? Okay, rectal so the areas? question, was there anything else done? I didn't interrupt you, did I? No. Okay, so the question was, um, you know, when we're looking at toxicities, particularly to the rectum, what are we looking at? Um, and the reason we're always looking at rectal toxicities and bladder toxicities are those are the two organs sandwiched right between it. And so there is no way of completely avoiding those organs. Um, although we're doing our very best to try to do that, to achieve it. Um, rectal toxicities tend to be two categories, same with bladder toxicities, acute, so initial, and then long term. The most common acute rectal toxicities, that is people going through radiation or in the first couple of months following radiation, tends to be a feeling of needing to poop, it tends to be an urgency to get to the bathroom, and diarrhea. Bleeding doesn't tend to happen until a little later on. But that is the major toxicity. So we're not talking life-threatening toxicity, but it's certainly bothersome toxicity. Diarrhea is becoming less and less common. Part of that is because we're not as big a field as we used to be. We used to be quite a large area to achieve a dose to the prostate. We're getting more and more targeted, so I think we're seeing less diarrhea. But this urgency to go or feeling of needing to go is really the rectum, and that's hard to kind of get rid of. So I always try to you know, you talk about so many things with patients when you're talking to them, but I try to say you'll, you'll have more of a feeling of needing to poop or an urgency to get to the bathroom that you may not have had before. Full up diarrhea is very uncommon. Um, what is more common, and that's about 10 to 15% of people after EBRT or external beam radiation, um, can get bleeding. That bleeding tends to be like a hemorrhoid, it's just a sudden onset of bleeding. It's worrisome because we always worry about colon cancer, so we encourage men to always get a colonoscopy if it's, if it's a repetitive bleed or it's a certain amount that's unusual. But the big thing, if there's any message to take away from it, is the way to avoid major toxicities is if someone ever does a colonoscopy, so that's a scope that looks inside of the rectum, <coughs> that you always tell that person, I've had high dose radiation, I've had radiation in my prostate, because what we always want to avoid is when they know you've had radiation, they'll see like a blush of red right where the radiation was given, and we never want them to biopsy that. And the incidence of when we see the very bad toxicity, which is called a fistula, or an opening between the bladder and the bowel, is in the instance where an ulcer is formed after that area has been biopsied, and then the fistula can form. The incidence of fistulas is very low. Um, in order to take, now very low, it's in, in terms of brachy therapy, that's where we have the best numbers because we follow patients for life after brachy. Um, external beam, I don't think we have the same kind of database that we've gotten for our brachy patients, and our incidence has been one in 500. Any special treatment for uh, that? For a fistula, and a colostomy. Yeah. So it's when you divert the bowel and you bring it to, the, you basically bring a bag to the surface and you don't because it's just too much that you can't really be leaking both ways because it's such a huge risk for infection, you'd have to have a colostomy. You can't really repair a fistula. 
not after high dose radiation. But our incidence, I mean, we, not to say to diminish it and how serious it is, but one in 500 is the incidence, and that is very low. Um, and that's after BRACI, but I feel that's, I'm more confident with that number than I could with an external beam. How common is radiation proctitis? So how common is radiation proctitis? So proctitis, what does it mean? All proctitis means is it's a conglomerate of symptoms that tends to be this feeling of needing to go, urgency to go, and primarily bleeding. And that's the number I quote is 10 to 15 percent. What about the damaged tissue from radiation? Does it recover or is it, it, doesn't, is it the gift that keeps on giving? Yeah, there's a lot of, I mean, I think so. the question is, you know, how long is that going to go on for? Um, we don't, you know, I'd say it's, it's something that is unlikely to be reversible. So it's probably irreversible damage. To what extent it causes a severe problem, though, is very rare. You don't see it. And I'd say we're, we've got radiation. Radiation's been used for decades and decades, but with very old techniques. What we don't have is these new techniques and what the incidence of the major issues in 10 years is going to be. But even with the old techniques, fistulas were less than 1%. Bleeding was probably more common. It probably wasn't really well documented, to be honest. You know, not everybody was followed for bleeding. Um, but probably was in the 20 to 25% range, and that's old techniques. So I think even when we're quoting 10 to 15%, we may be over-quoting it now that we're using better techniques. But we can't say with certainty that every image guide and change we make is going to result in a better outcome for that patient. We hope it is. But we don't still have randomized clinical data saying that that's the case. We just hope that it is. How long after uh, it's going to be in a, in a doctor do a biopsy of the colon? Like so how long after can it be? I say never, if possible. Anybody who has a really worrisome area that they're concerned enough about, you know, number one, what I say is if you get a colonoscopy, let that person know. And they generally are very aware not to biopsy right where the prostate cancer, or right where the prostate lies. And it's very obvious when they do a colonoscopy where that is. Um, they avoid it completely. If they have to biopsy it, it's important for them probably to talk to the oncologist and make sure that all that is in the know. It's extremely rare that they need to biopsy that area. Okay. But I definitely, I think that's, when we look at the people that have had fistulas, it has been in the instance of most often of people who've gotten a permanent ulcer as a result of a biopsy. So it doesn't mean every biopsy leads to an ulcer, it just puts up the chance of that happening. And that chance in our brachytherapy has been one in 500, which is quite low. I mean, if you look at surgical series, if you talk about toxicities and risks, anything, you know, that that's, that's a lower incidence. Some people don't even mention that. Um, I think we're in the era of mentioning everything, no matter how low the toxicity is, particularly if it's a very serious one. And what's the scale of external being minus the So that's brachytherapy alone. I would say the risk for external being would be in a similar, if not possibly slightly lower. It would not, I would not think it would be higher. But I do think that's why I think we need to be careful with these safer treatments that we're doing that we follow patients for 10 years and make sure that it is safe. But there doesn't seem to be any early indication of increased toxicity. And usually there are early indicators that there's going to be something to come. Yeah. If you have a, a radiation beam therapy and your um, cancer is coming back, can you have further treatments of radiation? So the question is, can you have further treatments of radiation after you've already been treated with what I call radical radiation, which means curative intent dose? Mm -hmm. Typically not. Typically we do not retreat. There are exceptions, like everything. Um, there are some instances where someone who has a focal recurrence, where it's been biopsy proven, so that means in the prostate, following brachytherapy, where repeat brachytherapy has been done. Um, and Dr. Juanita Cook, who actually works in Kelowna, probably has the greatest experience in that. It's rare, and it's only done in the very healthy patient, and we're in a locality that we feel is safe to redo it again. Um, but it's mostly in brachy, and part of that is because brachy is just, like I looked, 
uh, with you. It's so precise with how many small little seeds you can place in one particular area. You really can't do that with external being, not yet, where you can just shape a small little area and poke it right in that spot. I mean, with graphy, you know exactly where you're poking because you're putting it in the prostate. Um, so you're better able to sort of give a little dose. The problem with external beam is it's quite a large region and it's hard to treat just a small region, at least at this point in time. So I would say not, the majority of cases, no, we don't need treat with external beam.